you could go ahead and turn to the book of Colossians. Oh, well, welcome back. We'll take you any time. I think I may have said that this is one of my absolute favorite books. It's one of the, at least one of the top 66 favorite in the Bible. Um, fascinated by it, just the, the amount of truth that's packed into just these four short chapters. This, you know, I, sometimes you think about in Bible times as they would write these out on papyrus or scrolls or whatever they had most financially convenient to them at the time, how much space some of these took up and the, the effort it would have been to, to carry all of that, you know, if, even if you just had, you know, like the book of Isaiah, you know, feel like your arms would be burdened. And, and this is just a short letter. I mean, for us to think of it as a letter, like, well, I'd never write a letter that wrong. You know, we live in the day of, of letters, or what, 10, 15 words and a text message. That's our form of the letter these days. Um, but just so much information packed into this small book, uh, it is very concise. It's very, uh, the word is escaping me, that, but it's just, it's dense. Uh, and so at times some of the passages are, are a bit difficult not well let me put it this way the word that came to my mind earlier is they are they're very clear the doctrine the teaching is very clear but it's also complicated because again it's that short amount of space short number of words but just an overwhelming amount of detail uh, going into it and so as we kind of are in a, in a section uh, the last week and, and this week and probably a few weeks from now we'll, we'll come back and kind of pick up here uh, I want us to, to, to kind of get uh, I, I don't know that I can adequately cover in detail all that's being said here uh, these passages these verses are, are some in which you could take just a phrase and spend the evening uh, easily uh, and so, without trying to belabor the point, I am trying to be brief, somewhat brief, as brief as I can be, uh, concise and, and, and as less wordy as possible. Um, so I, I want us to get the, 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 the full understanding that, that's helpful, uh, but, I, but I hope that your, your appetite is being whetted to go back and read this for yourself and to, to really start to take it apart in an even greater detail. Uh, I would I would give a lot to to have the opportunity to spend the time in letters like this really fully and as deeply an hour upon hour of unpacking as possible. Uh, but the Lord is, doesn't have us in that place at this time. But there's I, I want you to recognize as we kind of skim through it. If, if maybe you see something and you're like, what did he just say there? If you're like me, you, you'll, you'll read a passage that you know the, the, the person is, is preaching from, and you're like, oh, I can't wait till they get to that phrase because I have no idea what it means. And by the end, you're like, they, they must not know what it means either. They skipped it. Uh, so if you think that of me, uh, ask. I'll, I'll try to help you understand. Uh, but something I have learned in, in studying full books of the Bible, that often the, the best commentary on those are these the very same letters. Uh, Paul will fill in the gaps uh, in, 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 his, in what he's trying to say as you read the entire thing two or three, four, five times. And look for the themes that, that go throughout. And, and I think we'll point at a couple of those tonight that maybe there'll be some of the wording that he uses will be more clear now that we hear it again in this passage as opposed to when we've heard it previously. And maybe there'll be some phrases that you're going to be like, okay, that's kind of awkward to pull up now. Why would you say that now? What is, what, what are you, where are you getting at? And I think as you get the, a bigger picture, you've, you've zoomed out a little bit and looked at more than a phrase, looked at more than just a couple of verses, get a whole paragraph, and then get the whole context of the letter. It'll start to, oh, okay, okay. And what's amazing is, is, is you look at some books like Hebrews that we're going through in the morning, and it's like you read that, and you're like, I'm reading the New Testament version of the Old Testament. It's so obvious. It's so clear. And while Colossians is so full of Old Testament detail, it's not as clear on the surface. Uh, so if you question something, you're like, that kind of get where you're, what you're trying to say. Pull back and, again, look at the context and, and start to ask questions about, okay, what, is, what, what was going on in the law? Uh, 
Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, those books that, that, that would relate to this. Because what the people Paul is dealing with, uh, it, similar audience to, to Hebrews, maybe not in, in culturally speaking, and in, in maybe not the same group of people, but similar in that you're going to find believers who love the Lord, who are obedient, who are looking to, to follow in the, the teaching of, the, of Paul and, and Paul's um, disciples, those that are, he's trained and those that he is training. They're, they're excited for these letters and they're, they're eating them up and they're trying to memorize them and they're trying to apply them. You've got some that are, that are curious, they're interested, they, they're, they're kind of on the fence there. They're, they've heard this gospel and, it's, and the Lord is calling them, the Lord is pulling them, but they're not quite there yet. And then you're going to have some unbelievers who are sitting in the audience listening to this saying, this is what you guys really believe? And they're confused because there's this, this just influx of false teaching. And, and, and so as we look at these different audiences, I want us to kind of put ourselves in those places and, and recognize, okay, here's where I am. Maybe, maybe I don't fully understand what's being said here. Maybe I don't fully grasp it. Uh, but I'm searching. But I'm hoping. But I'm learning. Maybe you are on that far spectrum that's like, well, this is the Word of God. It's alive. It's powerful. And I'm eating it up. And I can't wait for more. And I can't wait to fully understand it. But in, again, in that context, he's also talking to people who very much know the Old Testament law. They've grown up in it. They've followed it. These are former Jews who have been... Uh, I mean, while still culturally Jew, they have, they have renounced the law, understanding that it is Jesus who is the fulfillment of that law. It, Jesus has completed the law. That's what we saw that word completed multiple times throughout here. So it, it, it's not that the law was bad in and of itself, but it wasn't enough. It was just a, a shadow of what was to come. It was just pointing forward to Jesus. Jesus would come and say, okay, all of that pointed to me. And so some of them are still struggling with some of that. And because now all of a sudden they've got these false teachers that are coming in and saying, hey, remember that old law? You've got to attach that to Jesus. You've got to have Jesus and that. And some of this. And some of this. And, and I feel like I, I say this most every Sunday we've been in this, but I want it to help, under, help us kind of, that's the foundation to understanding where Paul is, is coming from. Knowing his audience and the purpose in his writing is confronting that false teaching helps a lot of this to make more sense. So as we jump into chapter 2, we're going to get a running start. We're going to start in verse 8, and we're going to uh, end somewhere, <laughs> somewhere around, uh, let's, let's aim for, uh, for 15 today. No promises. But Colossians chapter 2, verses nine, uh, verse, verse 8, excuse me. Beware... Does any man spoil you through philosophy and in vain deceit, empty deception, after the traditions of men, after the rudiments, the basic, simple teachings of this world, and not after Christ? Remember in verse 8, Paul is calling the false teaching empty, deceptive philosophy. He's calling it simple, basic teaching that's empty of, of the full truth. It, it may have some truth attached to it, but it's missing the point. And so as we look at the next few verses, much of this teaching was, was based on Old Testament law, again, which was just a shadow of what was to come, because the law cannot forgive you, the law cannot save you, the law cannot sanctify you. The purpose of the law was to point out your sinfulness and point you to your Savior. Um, we'll, we'll talk about the traditions again in a minute. But, he's, but, he, but remember that, be careful lest any man spoil you, uh, lead you away as captive or kidnap you with empty deception, empty wisdom that, that is really not even wisdom. It's lacking the full truth that, 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 that undergirds wisdom. Look at, uh, he says again, and not after Christ. Continue reading with me in verse 9. For in him, Christ, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him which is the head of all principality and power. And you are complete in him. You are made full. In him, verse 11, you also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened, made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us. He took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. 
So if we can remind ourselves, they, 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 this, 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 the context we're looking at, he's, he's saying here, this is the same paragraph that we're p kind of worked through last week. We're picking up where we left off and finishing the, this thought, I believe. But he, he's warning them, hey, be careful. They're coming after you with, with empty deception. They're lying to you. They're tricking you. They're trying to take you away as captive. And if they're taking you away, what are they taking you away from? It's Jesus. Jesus has rescued you. The, the, uh, Jesus has, has called you, has, has forgiven you, has, has offered you salvation. He has redeemed you. Don't go back and try to add these things in. Uh, I, I tried and failed miserably in my mind of, to come up with a, somewhat of an illustration. But imagine this morning we, we, we had come in sick, ill. And Heather, being the great nurse that she is, said, I've got the vaccine for all of you. Not the vaccine, the antidote to heal you. And we took it. We came back tonight, and everyone was healthy. The sores were gone. The cough was gone. The, the, the bedraggled look in your face was gone. The weakness, all of it was gone. It was almost like Heather gave us the miracle drug. And I praised it. And I was like, that drug is amazing. And it did such an amazing job in each of you and healing you. But guess what? Now I need you to all come over here and stand on your left foot, right foot in the air, kind of like a peacock or a flamingo, a flamingo, uh, not enough sleep, not enough caffeine, I'm struggling. And that will help complete the process of the medication. And you're looking at me like, um, I'm, I think the medication she gave me did it. The, the sores are gone, the coughing is gone. The weariness, the, the weakness, it's all gone. That doesn't make any sense. That's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, it is. So now that Jesus has rescued you, and now that Jesus has saved you, now let's go back and add the law in to complete the work that he already started. And we should stop and say, what can you add to Jesus? What can you add that, that, that wouldn't be more than who he is? I mean, he's rescued me. He's saved me. He's redeemed me. He's done the work that he promised. I, I have the Holy Spirit that is constantly in me, and he's, and he's rebuking me when, when temptation comes, and he's, and he's encouraging me, saying, no, don't give in. Keep at it. I have all of the riches of Christ. And now you want to add keeping this law in. The first response should be, um, no, Jesus is enough. The traditions, the, 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 the empty deception. I, I find here uh, a great warning in, in, in chapter 1. Verses 15 through 18, speaking of Jesus, who is the image, the, the very likeness of the invisible God, the visible God showing the invisibleness of his character, his attributes. It's, it's the visible uh, uh, that we can see, that we can touch, we could handle. Uh, you know, I, I, I sometimes am jealous of John, Peter, James, the others who, who sat with him and sat next to him. John himself reclined against Jesus at times because of that friendship that they had, that close bond. And Peter, walking with him, rebuked by him, but also corrected by him and loved by him, sent out by him, Peter said, we have a more short word of prophecy. Yes, I walked with him, but he is giving us a, a, few, uh, a full and final word that it is trustworthy, that it is to be obeyed, that it is to be followed. You have an even more short word of testimony that you can follow. The word is being completed, and now it is complete. And Peter was saying, hey, you've got that. And so we have here this Jesus, the, the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. By him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible, invisible, whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers. I told you that phrase would show up a few times tonight. All things were created by him and for him. He is the head of all things. He is before all things. And by him all things consist. Uh, people talk about the... The, the infiniteness of, of life, the, the, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the minuteness of every particle that makes us up is as infinite as the, the, the universe is expansive. Uh, you know, we are somewhere in the middle. And the thought of what holds all of this together, there is empty space between all of those particles. What makes that stay together? Scientists, I don't know. Paul said, I think his name is Jesus. <laughs> it is Jesus. By him, all things hold together. Are all things uh, sustained? 
by his hands. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. And they are trying to take Jesus and say he's good, but let's set him over here and let's add some more to it. And Paul is saying, be careful, watch out. And I think there's a great warning for us here. And, and, I, and I've written down probably some of the, probably the four most obvious false teachings that, that we are confronted by as far as, that I think are examples here. You have the LDS, the Mormons. Uh, as, soon as, as soon as I was thinking through this passage and, and thinking about false teaching, things being added to it, I remembered there, in the Book of Mormon there is a, a, two books called Nephi and Second Nephi. I think he borrowed that from somewhere. Um, the, the concept of you know, two books named after the same guy. Uh, but in Second Nephi chapter 25 it says, For we labor diligently to write, to persuade our children and also our brethren to believe in Christ, to be reconciled to God. For we know that it is by grace we are saved. After all we can do. That is the addition. Right in there. And what's fascinating is if you read large portions of the Book of Mormon, I wouldn't recommend it, but if you did, you would say that's a biblical phrase. That's a big, that, but that phrase has no, makes no sense in this context, but I've heard that in Scripture. And it's just this odd amalgamation of, of, of random thoughts from Scripture turned into some form of a false story. But then, and what's interesting is there are some Mormon theologians who want to say, okay, well, what, would they, what they were trying to say is, yet if you go back and look at the last hundred so years of, of their writings, it always points back to grace that is enabled by the work that we put into it. So it's Jesus plus you can get you salvation. Really? The Southern, uh, I can't even read my own typing. Uh, the Seventh day Adventist, you know, the inspired prophecies outside of Scripture, outside of the Bible, while they do believe it, it, on the surface of a, of, a, of a salvation by grace through faith, there is also this understanding of, well, you're going to hope that you were good enough in the end to maintain that salvation, and you'll find out after death. The Jehovah's Witnesses, like the Colossian heresy, they believe that Jesus is, was a created being, not the God of creation. He was Jehovah in bodily form. But they want to say, oh, he's just a created being. He's an emanation from God, uh, maybe even a lesser God, but he's not God. Catholicism, the worship of Mary, prayers to the saints, works salvation, the need to, to, to maintain certain uh, standards and, and, and to say certain things in certain ways. And you, all of these are just the, like I said, just the four top things that come to my mind as examples of false teaching that wants to creep in. Um, and, and doing some reading about this, I was reading about, a, uh, I believe it was the 1940s, 1950s, where uh, evangelicals and Se Seventh-day Adventists sat down to say, okay, do we actually believe and agree the same things? And it was like, yes. But then you start to see the footnotes. Okay, well, maybe this is a little off. Maybe, And, and they use the word heterodox, where it's, it's, it's another doctrine. It's, it's close, but it's not quite biblical. Red flags should be blowing up in your mind, not because we don't like them and it's like, oh, you're not, you know, you're not Baptist, you're not even Southern, I mean, you're not even Northern Baptist or, or Good Baptist, bad Baptist, you're not, you know, it's, it's not that, it's the fact that they're taking scripture and saying, okay, this is great, but let's, we need to add some things to it because there's, you, you don't fully understand it. Maybe you're missing something. The Mormons say this is, the, the, the King James Bible is the inspired version. It just wasn't accurately translated. And it's like, you, you, you hear this, and, and, and at first, on the surface, it's easy to say, what? But if we're not careful, are we not weak, and are we not able to be convinced of falsehood? Those are the four that jump out that are like, hey, okay, no, we would never go there. But you understand that, that especially major cults, they don't go out knocking door to door at homes, typically. Where do they get their converts? It's people who've grown up in churches and have heard truth and they've got just enough that they're distracted by, oh, I listened, to, I'm not spending so many times I've been able to go back to Utah and to work and to talk and to teach and to, and I love Utah. I, there's, there's a burden on my heart and good friends have planted churches there and started churches there to try to reach the Mormons and I have gone there and I have met so many and they've said, yeah, they were Baptists. 
but they liked the Mormon teaching on top of what they already believed. And it's just amazing to hear that and to go knock on doors. Oh, I was Baptist too. Or, you know, most a lot of the churches out there, there's a, an odd fight with that name Baptist. It's like, you know, there, there's an automatic, like, not going to talk to you. So some have used the term Bible church in a, in a way to just kind of cut out some of the, the middle. And as soon as people, oh, you know, I used to go to a good uh, a Bible church, I think it was. And, you know, even at one time, my, my grandmother was Baptist. But, we, you know, we just, I just really like the teaching that they add to, add to the scripture. And it's like they don't realize what they're saying. <laughs> but they're just saying, this was good, but it wasn't good enough. And Paul was saying, don't let anybody add to this. Don't let them add books in. Don't let them add their own books on the outside. Don't let anybody convince you that, that prophecy is, is, is continuing and because we have this short word of prophecy that is complete. We, 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 we do not have people adding to, to the message of the gospel by some random voice that they've heard. When somebody says to you, God spoke to me, oh, which, which passage of scripture was it? That's the first place you need to take them because you've got to be careful because people will say, well, God spoke to me. And be like, I don't think my God would ever say that. I don't think my God would ever teach, tell somebody to act that way. So be careful. Take people back to Scripture when they want to, 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 to speak about spiritual things. That's the first place we turn. Even in a secular world, outside of these religious, openly religious uh, categories, it's not a problem if you want to follow the simple teachings of Jesus. It's okay to love your neighbor. It's, it's great to show kindness instead of revenge. It's great to fight for social justice. But you better only tack Jesus onto our philosophies. Don't let him be the philosophy. That's, what, that's their mindset. It's okay to bring Jesus along, but... And so I ask the question, what can you add to him? Beware, be careful, lest any man spoil you, kidnap you. Verse 29, uh, chapter 2, verse 9, For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So what can you add to him? All of the deity of God resides in Jesus Christ. In bodily form. So there's that thought of, okay, if he's got a body, he can't be divine. And God said, okay, as the creator of all things, if I choose to take on flesh, I will take on flesh. Because if he didn't take on flesh, he couldn't be the redeemer that we needed. He could not have rescued us for our sins. He could not have died in our place if he didn't take on humanity. But if he was not fully God, he could not have been sinless. And if he had not been sinless, he could not have paid for our sins. So what can you add to Jesus? In him, all the attributes and characteristics of God are found. He is immutable. He never changes. He's omnipotent. He's omniscient. He's omnipresent. He is the giver of grace and mercy and love. He is faithful and he is loyal without fault. And this God, the complete God in Jesus, is the one in whom you are made complete. You are filled up by his fullness. The full God makes you full. The complete God makes you complete. He's the creator of life who offers you eternal life. He's the sustainer who provides everything you could ever need to live life for his glory. He's the perfect example who lived the sinful, sinless life. But he's also the spotless lamb who gave himself on your behalf that you might have forgiveness. So in these next few verses, Paul will confront some of the false teaching in more of a direct manner. I mean, all along, even in his introduction of, of, in the letter, hey, this, I'm Paul, you've heard of me, but you haven't met me. Um, even in his introduction, Paul was already starting to knock out the bricks, one at a time, just kicking the bricks out of the wall that was being built of false teaching. But here he's going to be a little more direct. It's going to be maybe a little more obvious. Um, some of the things that, that he has confronted, we, we, we read in chapter 1, the words principalities and powers. We saw it in, in the initial reading uh, in verse 10. This is uh, along with uh, chapter 2, verse 18, the, the uh, worshiping of angels. He's knocking that down a piece at a time. Uh, he has, from chapter 1 all the way up to this point, been talking about the deity of Jesus. Jesus is the very God. He is man. He is God. He is both. Uh, here we will see in verse 11 the confrontation of those who, who said, okay, well, Jesus is enough, but we also need to go back to the Old Testament law of circumcision, and we need to bring that back. 
uh, verse uh, 16 and verse 21 are going to point at dietary laws that they, okay, well, you've got to fit this specific diet. Do you know anybody that, that is almost religiously fanatical in their dietary law? Where in, to them, to, to go outside of that is, is, is equal to, on par with sin? And they try to pull that into their religiousness. Uh, that's not maybe as common to us. We, we, you know, maybe essential oils would fit there. Don't throw anything at me. Okay, it was a joke. Don't hurt me. I'm just teasing. Um, but I've, I, I knew a man once, an amazing evangelist. If I maybe described him, you may have heard of him. I cannot think of his name at the moment. But he a lot of health issues, burnt out, stress, and just trying to do the work in his own strength and decided that, you know, a almost purely vegan uh, diet was the way to go. And he almost began to preach that alongside of the gospel. And it was, I mean, it wasn't, at least at the beginning stages, it wasn't together. It was like, all right, so this is what you should do to be healthy. And here's the gospel. But I could almost see if he wasn't careful, those two starting to blend is how fanatical he was. Um, the phases of the moon, astrology and such. In verse 16, he'll point out those as well. Angel worship, we said in verse 18. And, and big word here, asceticism. I struggled so hard to spell that one. Um, I, had to use, I used, had to use the internet to help me. But basically, you know, overly strict, uh, even severe forms of self-discipline. Self-discipline is a godly characteristic. But this, to the extent of, okay, this, this form of self-discipline will make me more spiritual, will make me more holy. And the, the, all of this stuff, could you imagine this kind of a religion? Angel worship, doubts about G Jesus' humanity or his deity, uh, the, the, the requirement to maintain certain laws, the dietary laws, the watching the phases of the moons, holding certain celebrations. And, and, and it's not, we're not talking about these things back when we've got um, Moses putting, uh, holding the tablet for God to write on. We're not talking at that point. We've already gotten past that, and now we've seen how all of that pointed to Jesus. We're on the other side of Jesus, and now we've got to add all of that back in? What a difficult religion. What a difficult and oppressive uh, mentality. If, I've, if I can't do all of these things, if I don't hold to all of these standards, uh, I told you, I think it was last week, about a, a lady at work who was almost converting, trying to convert people, and, and her, her statement of, well, I can't lie because I don't want to go to hell. You just said you got saved by grace through faith, and now you're afraid of losing that salvation? What a fickle and pointless God to serve if He is that just, you lied, nope, give me the salvation back. That's not the God of Scripture. That's not the God of the Bible. That is a man-made idol. So now that we've spent 30 minutes in the introduction, uh, look with me at verse 11. Look at me with verse 11. In whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him, from the dead. This is one of those past, uh, couple of verses that I warned you about in the beginning that we're not going to spend a lot of time on. Hopefully give you enough information that you're getting the context and also having your appetite wet to go back and search some more. So, so we have these people trying to add this, this rite of circumcision back into the gospel. And, and, and Paul is going to say in, in a very brief, you know, you could write books uh, about the theology that he's, that he's going to represent in just a few words here. But he's, he's pointing back to the Old Testament saying, okay, so that was a, a symbol. That was a picture of what God was going to do for you in removing the sinful flesh. You know, we talk about the flesh. Um, the, uh, that... that, that natural tendency towards sin, that natural bent towards wickedness that we all have, sin nature. And, and there was a, a physical act that showed, okay, you are one of mine. And this is how we're going to show it. One of the ways in which we're going to show it. And so they wanted to go back to it and hold to it as, as a demand of the law that required, if you want any kind of spiritual blessing, this is what you're going to have to do. And Paul says, hold on, hold on, hold on a second. Look at the verses again. In whom, you know, you were circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. We're not talking about a, a physical, surgical act here. He says, this is talking about the putting off of the body of the sins of the flesh, the circumcision of Christ. 
This is that removal of sin. This is that removal. In, in, in reading this earlier, that, that, that idea of that removal of the flesh, I heard Paul crying out, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? The guilt of sin was so weighing on Paul in writing about the guilt of sin that Paul was just overwhelmed in that writing. It just, you know, what hope do we have? And find that verse in Romans and keep reading. Paul tells you the hope that he had. Um, he doesn't leave us hopeless there. But he say this is a representation of what Jesus was coming to do in removing all of that sinful flesh. You're no longer bound by it. You're no longer tied to it. You don't have the... The, as a believer, forgiven, your sins have been washed away, they've been removed, you are no longer bound by this body of death, this, the, the sins of the flesh. You have the right, you have the authority, and you have the, the power through Jesus Christ to resist temptation, to, to, to walk away from that sin, to say no. You're no longer a slave to it. And he brings in, in verse 12, this idea of baptism, and I'm pretty sure, you know, that we're not talking about baptismal pool here. He's, he's, it's the same context. It's one thought here. So he's talking about that removal of the flesh, that, the, that sinful uh, flesh, the, the guilt that is on us because of, uh, because of our sin, that Jesus removed at, forget, at that point of salvation when we were forgiven. And it says here, we were buried with him in baptism, wherein you also are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. So if you're a believer sitting right here, right now, you can look back in your mind, because we weren't there, to that point when Jesus laid out his life for us on the cross. And he died, and he was buried. And if you were a believer at this moment, when he was resurrected from the dead, you too gained new life there. You were resurrected there. He won it there. He, he, he gained it for you there. You're, you don't have to add anything back into it to get it. Jesus did all of the work. You can't do any of it. You have been resurrected with Christ. You've been identified with Christ. We use sometimes the word union with Christ. And that's what he's pointing to here. Look at verse 13. He, he sounds like Ephesians. His, his book to Ephesians here for a second. You being dead in your sins, the uncircumcision of your flesh, has he made a life together with him? So put 11, 12, and 13 as, as one thought. Maybe kind of one, one big picture to help put it all together for you. He says, you who were dead in your, the uncircumcision of your flesh, you have been spiritually cleansed. You have had that old flesh removed from you. You are a new man. You are a new creation. He's made you alive together with him. And he's forgiven you all your trespasses. When Satan tempts you to despair and tells you of the guilt within, I'm going to borrow that from the hymn writer, turn to this verse right here. Verse 14. He's forgiven you all your trespasses in blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against you, which was contrary to you, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. No amount of doing or not doing no amount of keeping a law or neglecting your desires can ever repair the damage done by sin. No amount of work on your part can restore you back to your pre-sin state. You cannot make the spiritually dead alive again, whether it's you or somebody else. You can do none of that. And let's add to the, to the weightiness of these thoughts. God is a holy and just God who cannot tolerate sin in His presence. So when you hear all of that and you s find yourself as a believer realizing that's not you anymore because Jesus did the work. God is a holy and just God who cannot tolerate sin in His presence. And it's an understanding of this truth that, 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 that led Paul to, to that cry of wretched man that I am who shall deliver me from this body of death. But then he turned and said there is one. There is one who, who did redeem. There is one who did rescue. As he cries that out in verse, we, we think of it as chapter 7. Set the, 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 um, the chapters aside for a moment and keep reading, A wretched man that I am, who should deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Verse uh, 1 of chapter 8, There is now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. This 
union with Christ, this completeness was accomplished by Jesus on the cross and we are in union with Him because of the work that He did. Read this verse again with me. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. That list of wrongs that you were guilty of. Whether you were 5, 6, 7, or 57 at your salvation, there was a long list of wrongs that you had done. You were guilty of, of every law. You have sinned in one aspect. You have broken every law. You are guilty of all of it. But he took that list, that handwriting of ordinances that was against you. It was contrary to you. He took it out of the way and he nailed it to his cross. Imagine that. For some of you, it'd probably be, you know, a four by six card. Just a short list, right? For some of me, <laughs> the scroll, and it rolls out the handwriting of ordinances that was against me. And Jesus blotted them out. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say, when I picture this, I picture that's the blood of Jesus just smeared all down that list. It doesn't say it specifically in these verses, but that's what I picture. That handwriting of ordinances, that list of wrongs, blotted out with the blood of Jesus, and then He nailed it to His cross. He got down off of the cross because He did the work there, and my sins got left there, nailed to it. He said, I'm finished. It is finished. I'm done. I've won the victory. Now let's nail your sin there and leave it. It was contrary to us. He took it out of the way, nailing it to His cross, and He spoiled principalities and powers. So not only do we see Him as the creator of principalities and powers, the head over all principalities and powers, uh, we, we, we see Him uh, now spoiling them, standing over them in triumph. Having spoiled principalities and powers, He made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. And I picture this, King Jesus, having come out of His tomb, the wounds in his arms, the wound in his side, the scratch marks and the, the, the scrapes uh, from the thorns on his head, and he is standing there with his kingly boot on hell, sin, and death's throat, and he's standing over it saying, I've won the victory for you. That one. How can you not read this and thank God for what he's done for you? But in the context of this, what can you add to the work that Jesus did? Why do we think we have to? How can we think that we can? Jesus has done this. He, we are made alive together with Him. He has forgiven us all our trespasses. He has blotted out the list of laws that you and I had broken. He took that list and He nailed it to His cross and He now stands resurrected triumphantly over sin, death, and hell saying, I have won the victory for you. Jesus is enough. The full God, full God in bodily form, did this work for you and for me. We'll pick up here. I actually got to where I wanted to get. We'll pick up here next time and look at some more of this in the context now looking back to that, that, that phrase there, that blotting out. I do like to joke about favorite verses. This is one of them. The other, very similar in Ephesians chapter 2. But God, who is rich in mercy, with His great love with which He loved us, we are made alive together in Him. All because of the work that He did. It is by His grace and His mercy. Lord Jesus, we are so incredibly thankful that you, Jehovah God, chose to take on flesh, to live among us, that you might live the perfect sinless life that we could never live, so that you might die the death that we so deserved. Lord, we thank you as we think about this passage and we think about the teaching here in Colossians and what you were doing through your child
child, Paul, what you were teaching those people, what you were teaching the, the generations after all the way to us and the generations to come, is that you were enough. We can't d take anything from you. We can't add anything to you. You are simply sufficient for our salvation, for our sanctification. And Lord, with those Old Testament saints, we look forward to that day where we will live in a city whose builder and maker is God because we know that we are citizens of that heavenly place. And as we go on our journey and we say no to anything that would detract from you, give us eyes to see and ears to hear that we might understand when friends and family, neighbors, co-workers are being beguiled, they're being kidnapped with falsehood, that we might lovingly step in and say, let me show you what Jesus has done for you. Lord, help us. Protect us. Protect this church. Lord, that we would never stray from your truth. And that we would stay a lighthouse here in Auburn and by your grace around the world proclaiming your goodness, your sufficiency, your all-sufficient grace, your everlasting mercy. We ask praying this through Jesus' name. Amen.